Welcome to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Nicholson, here with bite-sized episodes to empower, educate, and enlighten you with ways to lose weight, heal your gut, and achieve your ideal health so you can live an adventure-filled life. Let's dive in. Welcome back to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. Today, we are going to talk all about metabolism and metabolic health. This will kick off a brand new series on metabolic disorders, what they are, how they happen, what you can do about them, and even how to test for them. Metabolic health is one of my primary focuses in my practice because studies have shown that nearly everyone has some level of metabolic dysfunction in America. In 2018, a study was published by the University of North Carolina and found that only 12.2% of the population meet all five primary criteria of good metabolic health, which were waist circumference, blood sugar or glucose, blood pressure, triglycerides, and HDL cholesterol. Or they considered you to be not metabolically healthy if you were taking medications for any of these conditions. And those statistics that they based this study on were collected between 2009 and 2016. So this was all pre-pandemic. Many studies have shown that the overall population of adults and kids have gotten dramatically sicker during the pandemic and not from the virus. So it's highly likely that these numbers are even worse today. So years ago, only 12% of the population met all five of these criteria for good health. It's far more likely that significantly less actually meet that criteria today. So whether you personally have any of these conditions or not, this information is valuable because I guarantee you know someone who has poor metabolic health. So metabolism is often thought of simply as how many calories you burn each day, as in you have a fast or a slow metabolism. In this context, it's really boiled down essentially to how easily you lose or maintain weight. But this is only one small part of metabolism. Metabolism really sums up every chemical reaction in your body that's contributing to energy production and utilization. And these are directly impacted by your food choices, your gut microbes or your microbiome, the type and duration of exercise, sleep quality and quantity, stress management, mental health, lifestyle, any medications that you're on, and so much more. Having a healthy metabolism means that your body can properly digest and absorb the nutrients from your foods. I mean, let's face it, if you can't properly break down your food and or properly absorb those quality nutrients that you are taking in, what good is it to eat a healthy diet? You're not getting any benefit out of it anyway. So we really need to optimize digestion to make sure that you're actually taking in those great nutrients. Now we also want to avoid large blood sugar spikes, excess fat in your blood, high levels of inflammation, and excess insulin doses being released. All of these conditions can contribute to elevated levels of unhealthy cholesterol, increased body fat storage, a larger waist circumference, and high blood pressure. Having good metabolic health means you have a lower risk of metabolic diseases. This means your body can respond to and use food in a beneficial way that reduces your risk of chronic diseases. There are some factors like age, genetics, and sex that, well, you don't have any control over, but this is mostly driven by things you do control, like what you eat, how often you eat, how much you eat, how well you take care of your gut microbiome, how well you take care of your liver, how much and what type of exercise you do, how well you manage your stress loads, 
and how well you prioritize your mental health. In the study out of North Carolina, where they noted the 12% were metabolically healthy, they also noted that less than one third of people with normal weight were metabolically healthy. So less than a third of the people who are not even overweight actually fit all five of these criteria. So this is not just about being overweight. Of course, being overweight or obese did increase the risk where they found 92% of those in the overweight classification and 95% of those in the obese categorization were metabolically unhealthy. So rarely were people overweight or obese that actually fit all five of these criteria. But two thirds of normal weight people were also not found to be metabolically healthy. So what are some of the metabolic diseases and conditions? Most people think of this as type 2 diabetes and obesity. But metabolic diseases also include heart disease, cancer, stroke, kidney disease, fatty liver disease, even things like migraines and infertility conditions like PCOS and erectile dysfunction, and even thyroid disorders fall into this category. Inflammation is another big category that can often be elevated in those with metabolic diseases. And inflammation causes and worsens metabolic diseases, autoimmune conditions, pain, and even fatigue. So let's break down just a few causes of unhealthy metabolic function that you can control. The first one is blood sugar spikes. Over time, this can cause inflammation, oxidative stress, which is free radical damage, and changes in the proteins that carry your fats and cholesterol through the body. It makes these carrier proteins less able to offload the cholesterol and the fat molecules into the cells where they're actually needed. So this leaves them roaming the blood continuing to get damaged and can increase the risk of them accumulating in damaged arteries, leading to atherosclerosis. Blood sugar spikes also cause insulin spikes. Insulin is a vital hormone produced by the pancreas, and it's necessary for life. Hence why those with type 1 diabetes must take insulin because they cannot produce it. Insulin's primary role in the body is it acts like a key that allows glucose from the blood into the cells where it can be used for energy. If this doesn't happen properly, the sugar stays in the blood for too long. This contributes to inflammation and further blood vessel damage, which again contributes to atherosclerosis and all of the heart disease risk factors. Sugar is actually toxic when it's too high in the blood. Insulin allows the glucose into the cell. Insulin allows glucose into the cell and then tells the cell what to do with it. If the energy is not immediately needed, it tells the cell to convert that sugar to fat. This means insulin is a fat storage hormone, meaning you'll be far more likely to pack on fat than you will be to burn fat. In fact, insulin blocks burning of fat because why would it make any sense to be both burning and storing at the same time? You can really only be doing one or the other. So if you're not needing the energy right away, you're storing it and you're storing it mostly as fat. With elevated insulin levels over time, cells throughout the body become less responsive to the presence of insulin. So the body initially produces more and more, but eventually it loses its capacity to produce enough. Now, having elevations of fat in your blood is also a risk factor for unhealthy metabolism. Now, this is surprisingly not about eating dietary fat. The fat in your blood is mostly driven by how many carbohydrates you're eating. These carbohydrates get converted to glucose and then go from the digestive system to the liver. In the liver, 
some of the glucose is converted to glycogen for storing sugar. However, we can only store so much glycogen. Any excess gets converted to triglycerides for storage. This storage can occur right in the liver, contributing to fatty liver, or these triglycerides can be shipped throughout the body for storage in any tissue, like your organs, your muscles, your belly, anywhere. The next category that affects metabolic health is stress management. Stress causes alterations in stress hormones, increases inflammation, and increases blood sugar. Just think about it. Stress is your body perceiving a threat. Historically, this threat would have been a risk of dying, something that you needed to flee from or fight. Either fleeing or fighting would require energy. Therefore, the body releases a rush of sugar for immediate use. But today, we more often sit and stew in our stress over finances, relationships, traffic, work, etc. We don't actually need any excess energy to handle these stresses or to survive these stresses. But we don't have control over that part. This is an automatic response when we perceive a stress. And this perception can be just that, the imagination of stress. Worrying about something can still cause this, even if it never actually happens. So do your best to reduce stress, eliminate as many toxic relationships as possible, and try to live in the now so that you're not adding to the stress by worrying about things that haven't happened or already happened. The next category is insufficient quality or quantity of sleep. Sleep is one of those often overlooked categories of health. Now, most of us know when we've done a poor job with sleeping, when we feel really sleepy, or we just know we didn't get enough sleep for whatever reason. But a huge portion of the population aren't getting adequate amounts or sufficient quality sleep. Only about 5% of the population have the genetic profile to function properly on less than six hours of sleep. But studies have shown that between half and two thirds of the population are not getting sufficient sleep. The problems with inadequate sleep are numerous. You have poor immune function, decreased energy and strength, increased blood sugar levels again, reduced inhibitions around food, decreased metabolism and increased appetite, reduced weight loss, reduced capacity to manage blood sugar levels, altered hormone levels, decreased focus and concentration, reduced memory and the ability to learn complex skills, and reduced emotional resilience. So stress bothers you even more. The bottom line is inadequate sleep is directly contributing to increased risk of chronic disease. And the final category that I will talk about today is exercise. Both too little and too much, both a sedentary lifestyle and overtraining are stressful on the body. We need to move. We need to work our muscles. We don't have to run marathons or do extreme workouts. You can walk, jog, lift weights, yoga, dancing, even gardening, housework, cooking, anything physical that requires movement is good. So strive to stand instead of sitting, walking instead of standing, and increase resistance against gravity as much as you can with things like taking the stairs, walking up hills, and lifting heavy objects. There are so many more factors involved with healthy metabolic function, and we will continue to dive deeper into many of these in upcoming episodes where we're going to talk about various conditions like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, thyroid disorders, and even cancer. 
So stay tuned. And as always, I would love it if you would leave me a five-star review in whatever podcast player you are using. And if you have questions, shoot them over to me. I am happy to address them in future episodes. So until the next one, be well and thrive. Thanks for being a faithful listener to the podcast. I'd love it if you left me a five-star review on this podcast so that others can more easily find this valuable information. Did you know I also work one-on-one with clients? I approach solving health challenges like I approached solving crimes by conducting a thorough investigation into your case. Whether you're looking to lose weight, boost your energy, fix your digestive system, or reduce inflammation, I can help. All you have to do to get started is book a free call. The link is in the show notes.